Once again, good morning. I have some good news for you. It is slowly getting warmer in here. Thanks to all the body heat, it went from 58 to 59 degrees. <laughs> Whew. Give us a couple more hours and maybe we'll hit 60. I don't know. Well, I'm glad you're here, especially after you lost an hour of sleep and it's cold and it's tempting to stay home. You're like, surely the warmth and comfort of the sanctuary will be wonderful. For those of you on live stream, I hope you're enjoying your cozy pajamas and coffee on our behalf. Well, today we are finishing our series on simplicity. Over the last several weeks, we've been talking about a practice, a habit that you and I can choose to do to help us become more like Jesus. You see, throughout the ages for most of history, practicing simplicity has been a means of recognizing that this world and the things in it will leave us empty at some point. Practicing simplicity has been an opportunity to connect with Jesus by saying, I want him to be more important in my life than even the furnace that I rely on week in and week out. It was not a purposeful thing, I promise. But this practice of simplicity, it's not just something good that we can consider doing. Jesus actually instructed his disciples to practice simplicity. You see, when he sent out his disciples in three of the four gospels, he sends them out to do some pretty significant work, casting out demons and healing the sick and preaching the good news, some pretty big things. And he says, don't take any second tunic or money bag. Don't take a second staff. Like, it'll be okay. You don't need all those other things. I'll provide for you. And in this culture in which we are bombarded with advertisements over and over and over again of the things we need, that we need more and more in our life, it is sometimes difficult to see God as the provider of every need when we have all this stuff that can fill that need as well. So as we finish up this simplicity series, we're going to end with kind of the goal of why we're doing all of this anyway. See, simplicity by itself will actually just be minimalism and not lead you to anything better. Simplicity without an aim or without a goal is just intentional poverty. But simplicity with a goal, specifically a goal of contentment, learning to find peace in any situation, learning to recognize that life is not a made up of the stuff you own or the things people think about you. Life is not the things you wear. Life is not the schedule you keep. Life is more. Simplicity is aimed at growing in contentment, learning how to recognize when things are good and things are bad that God is still good and it'll be okay. No matter what happens next, don't worry. We've talked over this series about the number of times that Jesus warns. He says, don't be anxious. Don't be worried about the food you will eat or the clothing you will wear. Your Father in heaven knows these things and will provide them. Contentment is learning in all situations that God really does care for you and it'll be okay. Now, last week we talked about 1 Timothy chapter 6 where Paul writes to Timothy, a young pastor, and he gives him some encouragement. Here's how you go about doing this. And then at the end of his letter, he gives a warning to the rich. Those who are wealthy, beware. And we talked last week that money is not bad. What we do with our money could be bad. And I mentioned we'd come back to this. So let's come back to 1 Timothy. Here's what he says. He says, now there's great gain in godliness with contentment. For we brought nothing into the world and we cannot take anything out of the world. But if we have food and clothing with these, we will be content. Paul, he says, look, there's great gain in godliness with contentment. When our life is oriented around becoming more like Jesus, looking more like him, reflecting him to the world, and when we're content with whatever he brings our way, there's great gain in that. And that gain may or may not be monetary. This isn't a prosperity thing. But our life is better when it's oriented around God 
and that being enough. There's great gain here. Elsewhere, Paul, he writes about contentment, and he writes about the difficulty of life. You see, Paul didn't live a comfortable life, at least for some of his life. Paul grew up in a decent family well enough that he was trained and educated. He was well aware of scripture. He was taught how to speak and to present and to preach. He was given opportunities to grow in the social status and climb the social ladder. He was given all sorts of things. As a Jew and a Roman citizen, he had the best of every world. And then Paul met Jesus and things changed for him. He began to realize that his pursuit of all of these things were missing the point. It's not about pursuing the appearance of being holy or pursuing the right religious traditions or pursuing making sure that God is well defended. No, it's about living with God for God. It's about living for others who don't yet know him. And Paul, he reoriented his life around proclaiming to those who were disconnected from God, far off, those who were told, you're not enough, God doesn't care. Paul reoriented his life and said, let me tell you just how much God cares. It made a lot of people mad. And in the process, he lost a lot of the life he had before. The respect, the money, everything. Through it all, Paul multiple times ends up in prison. And he's in prison specifically because he's telling people about Jesus and that causes a stir. There are some who are mad because they think Jesus is a blasphemer. He's against God. There are others who are mad because they see the turmoil being caused by this Jesus person and they think it's gonna turn into civil unrest. How dare we have civil unrest? And so for multiple reasons, sometimes often falsely, Paul is imprisoned because of his faith. He knows all about hardship and challenges. And in this letter to the church in Philippi, he writes to them and he says, I know you've been concerned for me and I appreciate that. He says, I know through these journeys and through this difficulty, you have yourself been pained by my pains. But look, I I need to tell you a little secret. This, This is what he writes. I rejoiced in the Lord greatly that now at length you have revived your concern for me. You were indeed concerned for me, but you had no opportunity. Not that I'm speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. Now we'll pick up what he continues here in a moment. But Paul, he's writing to this church and he says, I so appreciate your concern, but I don't have any needs. It'll be okay. You see, I've learned in everything, whatever need, the secret to be content. Wouldn't that be nice? Like just take a moment and think of your week this last week. Has there been anything that's caused you stress or anxiety, or worry, or fear? Have you filled up your gas tank recently? Oh boy, there's all kinds of things we can easily go, what is this world coming to? Will I have enough? Will I be enough? What will happen if something bad comes my way? Then what? Paul, he says, look, it doesn't really matter what happens. God's providing for me. Then he continues, he goes on, In verse 12, I know how to be brought low and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. What would your life look like if this was something that rang true with you too? In any and every circumstance, I've learned the secret to contentment. Are you hungry? It'll be okay. Are you poor? It'll be okay. Are you cold? Are your relationships falling apart? Are you struggling to find a job? It'll be okay. Is the world falling apart around you? It'll be okay. Is everything right now going great? You feel a little guilty because 
it's not for people you care about, it'll be okay. Is everything going great and you haven't paid any attention to the hurt of other people? It'll be okay. Paul says, look, I've learned how to be brought low and how to be lifted up. I've learned how to have a lot and how to have nothing. I've learned it all. And he continues, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. This is the secret to contentment. Now, let's just real quick point out, anybody ever heard this last verse here before? Anybody ever seen it plastered on a wall? Or like you forgot to study for a test in school, and so you show up to the test like, I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Let's pass this test right now. That is not what it's about, by the way. You won't be a better baseball player or pass the test or get the job because of this verse. No, Paul, he says, look, the secret to contentment, to being okay with whatever comes your way. The secret is Christ who strengthens me, him. If we have Jesus, he is enough. See, the truth of the matter is Jesus warned us, hardships will come. He said, in this world you will have trouble Take heart, I have overcome the world. He doesn't say you might have problems or you could have problems if the wrong person is in power or if war starts or if prices rise. No, he says you will have trouble, but I have overcome this world. For Paul, in all things, the strength that comes from knowing Christ himself, Jesus, has walked this world has suffered and experienced anguish and hardship and pain and sorrow, has been brought low and lifted up. For Paul, this was enough to say, whatever comes my way, it'll be okay. As you and I begin to practice simplicity, this practice is not about our stuff. It's about our heart. In all things recognizing we will not be able to say it is okay because of our 401k. We will not be able to say it is okay because of the person we elected or the people that are around us. We will not be able to say it's okay by any of our circumstances if it's not in Christ alone. Simplicity is learning to remove all that excess so we can focus on what really matters. The most important thing for you and me is that we have a God who knows our sorrows. But take heart, he has overcome the world. He's overcome it all. There's nothing that surprises him. There's nothing that catches him off guard. There's nothing he can't handle. So when we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, will fear no evil. His rod and his staff comfort us. When we go through those hard times and those difficult times, he can be our strength. And he will be. Simplicity is learning to shift our focus from the things around us to him. Teach me, Lord, how to walk with you. Now, how do we begin to become content? That's the real struggle. See, it's easy to talk about contentment and it's even easy to go through your closet and get rid of clothes or to go through your house and get rid of stuff. It's pretty simple to do that, but how do we actually experience contentment? Because the problem is if you get rid of all your clothes, you may then realize, I wish I had more clothes. Like I went through my closet and pared down to now I have one pair of jeans and khakis and black slacks, that's it. Well, I spent this week doing some demolition on, uh, on a house we just purchased, and so my jeans were filthy, and I realized I have to wear shorts, and it snowed. Whoops. Wasn't thinking when I went through the closet there. You see, just getting rid of your stuff won't make your life content by itself. You have to begin to shift your posture and your attitude towards something different. 
So as we eliminate stuff from our lives, I want to suggest six different ways that we can begin to grow in contentment. Things that we can add to our life that will easily help us experience that Jesus is enough in all things. You ready? Here's the first one. Practice gratitude. Practice gratitude. See, when we're thankful for something, it becomes a lot harder to forget the things we don't have. The more we focus on what we don't have, the more we'll see there's a long list of things we don't have and will never have. But when we practice gratitude, we get, we get to begin to recognize in every circumstance, what is God doing? What has he done? So how do we practice gratitude? Well, perhaps you can start by making a habit of taking time each day and writing three things that you're thankful for. You want to do more? Maybe you do three at every meal. Want to do less? Maybe you just do one. Make a habit of writing down something you're thankful for so you can look back on it later and go, oh yeah, God has been with me through this time. How else could you practice gratitude? Maybe you and your family could make a habit of talking about things you're thankful for outside of just the month of November and Thanksgiving. Like, what if every time you sat down for dinner as a family, before you ate, you all shared one thing you were thankful for that day? Would you begin to see God's blessings and his strength and his presence in every day? So if you want to grow in contentment, begin to practice gratitude. Second, take captive your thoughts. See, the truth is, if you're anything like me or like most people I know, your mind will wander to stuff you're not content with. For me, it's really easy to think about all the stuff I haven't yet done, all the things I, I still need to do, and so my schedule becomes super, super full. I realized just how unhealthy this is a few weeks ago. You see, three weeks ago, my wife and I had the opportunity to go out of town for a work conference and then take a few days of vacation, and it was the most restful time I've had in a decade. Like, I don't remember being that at peace in a long time. And what I didn't realize until the end of the next week is there was a part of me that had felt guilty for taking time off, and so I overloaded my schedule the next week to compensate and so I ended up working like 65 hours that next week and I was gone for every bedtime, which is important for our family. So I wasn't there for the kids trying to make up for having rested. And it was only at the end of the week when I realized this that I could begin to say, that's not healthy and that needs to change. To take captive your thoughts is to recognize the things that are pulling you away from contentment and by giving them a name, beginning to address them. Is it your Shopping addiction? Recognize when you want to go shopping, what are you thinking? What are you hoping to gain from buying something new? What are you hoping to gain in that moment? Is there a way to find it without shopping or filling your schedule or doing those things you would often do instead? By take, taking captive our thoughts, we're able to address the insecurities and the anxieties and the worries that are keeping us from the peace Christ has to offer. So we can practice gratitude, we can take captive our thoughts. Third thing here to grow in contentment, this one's pretty tricky, stop buying things. Just stop buying things. You want to go to Taco Bell, and you, you pull into Taco Bell, and you realize, I have a full kitchen of food at home, and it's just five minutes away. You're like, I really want the Taco Bell. I'm going to drive home and eat a sandwich. You'll learn contentment pretty quick that way, or you'll really, really learn to be grateful when you do get Taco Bell, right? Stop buying things. This house my wife and I are moving into that we just purchased was filled to the, the brim with stuff. Like we're finding stuff inside the walls. It's so full of stuff. And some of it makes sense. There are things in this house that I'm like, oh, that would be a good thing to purchase. There are other things that don't make any sense. 
Like who in this world needs 62 bottles of shampoo? I do over the course of a long time. I don't need 62 bottles at one time. The best way to practice contentment is to stop buying things. And then you'll begin to realize how much we were, all of us, addicted to or attached to the things we buy. Next, let go of comparison. See, the enemy of your contentment will be recognizing that somebody else is better than you or has more than you or is more appreciated than you or whatever. When you compare yourself to another, you will always fail. When you compare yourself to yourself, you will always fail. See, we can make comparisons that are about our own doing too. I should have been more organized. I should have done this. And we should all over ourselves. And in doing so, we just make a mess of our mind and our heart and the life around us. So stop comparing. When you recognize you're comparing yourself to another, if only I looked like them, if only I dressed like them, if only I had a house like them, if only I drove a car like them, if only whatever it is you're comparing... By taking captive that thought, you can begin to say, who am I apart from these things? More importantly, who is Jesus? What has he given to me? What has he promised to me? What does he say about me? That will always, always be more rewarding. So stop comparing yourself. Next, invest in the life of others. There's this weird, weird thing that happens when we pour into somebody else. See, the more we pour into somebody else, the more we begin to find our own life is fulfilling and rewarding and wonderful. How do you regularly invest in the life of somebody else? Maybe that's finding somebody who could really use a mentor right now. Now, don't go and just be like, hey, I'm really smart, I could mentor you. It's probably not going to be well received. But maybe you could just start by taking them to coffee consistently. Hey, can can we go to coffee once a month? I just want to hear how you're doing in life. And I just want to listen. And maybe out of that place of listening, not so that you can respond, but because you're genuinely interested in them, maybe out of that place you can find things that you can offer for encouragement or support. Maybe one day, wisdom. Intentionally investing in somebody else doesn't mean you have to fill your schedule all the time. It can be as simple as when you're at home, be at home. Turn off your work emails. Put your phone away so that you're actually paying attention to your kids and not just going, "Uh uh-huh, yeah, that's nice, and not looking at the art they drew for you. You want to invest in the lives of others? Make a point to find what's good in the people around you and to tell them that. Tell them the things you appreciate about them, the things they're doing really well. Remind them of how much they're loved. When you and I invest in others, we will always find a return on our investment that is worth every bit of our time and our energy and our money. Finally, how can we begin to grow in contentment to find peace in every situation? We need to recognize that contentment is not the same as complacency. See, sometimes people push against being content because they're like, but I want to grow, I want to change, I want to improve, and if I'm content, I'm just going to sit around apathetic and lazy and do nothing towards that. Contentment is not complacency. Complacency is saying who I am and where I am in my life, nothing needs to change. If that were the case, you would be perfect. And if you're perfect, you're in the wrong church because we're not perfect. The truth of the matter is every one of us has something that needs to grow, something that needs to be transformed into the likeness of Christ. So complacency is saying I don't need to be changed Contentment is saying, even as I'm not yet who I want to be, 
God is enough for me right now, in this situation, and in this moment. And so we can endeavor to grow and to change and to be transformed while still walking in that peace each and every day. Contentment, one of the things that it does is it doesn't just give us peace, but it actually brings the best out of the life we're currently in. See, contentment is grounding us in reality that we here and now are here and now. You can't change what happens three weeks from now because you don't know what's happening three weeks from now. You can't change what happened a month ago because we can't go back in time. It's already happened. The only thing you and I can do is live in the present with our aim on the future. We know that Christ is coming back. We know that one day he will restore all things. For Paul, when he was imprisoned, when he was suffering, when he was hungry, when life was tough, Christ could strengthen him because he knew one day all of this hardship will end. One day it'll go away. For now, we endure just as Christ endured for us. We suffer the hardships. We press on through the difficulties. We learn that in every circumstance, Jesus is enough. And in those moments where he just feels too far out of reach, we lean on one another. Say, I don't know how Jesus can be enough here. Will you help remind me of that? And with this forward hope and this community together, our simple life is really, really wonderful. Not only for us, but for a world around us that is torn by all kinds of chaos and demand for more. As we practice this practice of simplicity together, it is my hope that you and I will find a greater peace in today for whatever tomorrow will bring. Will you pray with me? Heavenly Father, we thank you that you have sent your son, that in this world we may have trouble, but you have promised we can take heart. You have overcome this world. Godliness with contentment is great gain. God, teach us to pursue becoming like you. In doing so, Lord, we ask that you would help us to live each moment, every moment knowing, whatever may come, you are enough. May we begin to grow in contentment, to be grounded in reality, to practice gratitude, to invest in the lives of others, to stop pursuing the material things that will fade away, but to know that as we pursue you, you will never disappoint or leave us high and dry. Strengthen us in this endeavor and teach us to walk with you all of our days. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As we continue our worship this morning, we're going to continue by collecting an offering. Last week I introduced something that we've talked about in the past called the 90-Day Tithe Challenge. I want to share briefly a little more about what that is in case you're interested because I just really briefly talked about it. The tithe is from the Hebrew word that literally means 10%. And in the Old Testament, a tithe was mandated of every believer to give to the temple, which was in turn used to support the priests and the sacrifices and the people who were poor and needy. Now, we don't make sacrifices here, and, and it's not about supporting me in these ways. We don't believe that a tithe is mandatory in Jesus. But as we seek to practice simplicity, there's a, a twofold reality that on the one hand, we let go of things and we own less things, and on the other hand, we learn to share generously with those in need. And so we believe in this place that practicing a habitual lifestyle of giving helps us to see that God will provide for our every need. And we try to aim this giving towards the poor and the needy and also the work of the church in sharing this good news of Jesus.
And so when you tithe or when you commit to giving on a regular basis, what you're doing is saying, God, I choose to trust you in all things, including my finances. Now, two weeks ago, we had Will from Raising a Voice here, and he shared with you about the work that they do. And I said, we are going to give half of this week's offering away to Raising a Voice. And I just wanted to give you an update of where that's at. On Friday, I dropped off a check when I picked up more coffee for us. And I dropped off a check for $3,000 for the work they're doing. That's awesome. Thank you for your generosity. And because we believe that a habit of giving is really good and healthy, we created what we call the 90-day tithe challenge, which is if you've never habitually given in the past, try it. Maybe your budget is such that you're like, I can't do 10%. Okay, try 1% or try $5, or whatever it is for you in your budget, something to stretch you. And if at the end of 90 days, you find yourself lacking and hurting and struggling, and you find yourself saying, God was totally absent, and I did not feel closer to him through this practice, let us know, and we will graciously give you all of that money you gave back. How's that sound? 90 days, and try it. See if God will show up in ways you didn't expect and do things you weren't planning for. If this is something you would like to do and you would like to grow in this practice, this QR code here will take you to a place on the website. You can just let us know. We're not going to follow up with you and be like, where's the money? That's not happening. We're simply going to be praying for you in this journey that God would make himself abundantly clear through your practice of habitual giving. All right? With that, if you came prepared to give today, whatever it is, uh, if you prefer to give cash or check, you can do so in the popcorn buckets in the back as you exit. If you prefer to give online electronically, you can do so at thepointknocks.com by clicking the little teal button in the bottom corner. However you give and whatever you give, know this. We don't give to get God's love, but because we already have it. Thank you.